Hello, this is Nick Dale from Nick Dale Photography. What I'd like to do now is to go through a few tips for going on a game drive or um, on a safari in Africa. So, first of all, what equipment do I need? Well, it's always useful to have a full frame DSLR or in fact two camera bodies. I personally have two, a Nikon D810 and a D850 which allows me to switch effortlessly between the two, which means I can use a long lens or a short lens or something in the middle, depending on whatever I fit in the first place. Um, the last thing you want to do when you're on a game drive is to have to fiddle around with swapping lenses. Now, what counts as a long lens? Well, for wildlife photography, unfortunately, usually the animals are going to be quite a way away, unless you get very lucky. So I'd suggest something 400 millimeters long or longer. I have an 80 to 400 millimeter lens, and I also have an 800 millimeter lens with a 1.25 teleconverter, which means it's effectively 1,000 millimeters or 20 times magnification. Now, that's obviously useful for bringing distant objects closer, but also for closer objects and animals, you can actually get some great close ups, and close ups are one of the things I love. Now, in order to carry all this, you obviously need a camera bag. I've been through a few camera bags in my time, but I've eventually settled on a camera bag with wheels, which is very important when you're getting around the place, particularly in airports. So having a rollerboard makes life a lot easier. And if it's small enough to count as cabin luggage, then that means you don't have to put anything in the hold, which is a very bad idea when you've got very expensive kit, like your cameras, your lenses, and your laptop. Now, once you're over there, it's always difficult to keep your camera clean with all the dust and dirt and various things in the atmosphere. But the most important aspect of the camera to keep clean is your sensor. Now, this is a bit of a tricky operation, but if you can manage to clean your sensor while you're over there, then you'll avoid lots of trouble in Lightroom trying to take out sensor spots later on in post-processing. As I say, it is tricky, but it just requires a little bit of lotion, some cleaning fluid, and um, some sensor swabs, as they call them. And it's pretty cheap, but you just have to have a steady hand. It's also useful to carry a laptop with you so that you can upload your pictures every afternoon or every lunchtime after your game drive. And I usually use Lightroom, which is very good for organizing your photos and also working on them. Uh, some of the other things are optional. Uh, I rarely take a polarizing filter with me on a game drive, but um, if you want super saturated color or some nice blue skies, then it's up to you. But the cost is that, um, well, first of all, you have to pay for it in the first place, but then um, you also lose around a stop of uh, light. So effectively, you're only dealing with half the amount of light that enters the lens if you fit a filter. Now, some people take binoculars. I'm a little bit lazy sometimes, but I am conscious that you know, everyone has a responsibility to find the animals for everyone else in the Jeep. So having a good pair of binoculars is always good. A lot of people get uh, very posh Swarovski binoculars. They're at the top end, but obviously you can take whatever kind you like. The smaller the better from a packing point of view, but the larger the better from a spotting point of view. So it's up to you to make that trade off. It's very difficult to use a tripod on a Jeep, so going on a game drive most of the time, that's not really very useful. But sometimes on safari, you do go on walking trips. Um, I always tend to avoid them because it means generally you won't be seeing any interesting animals, <laughs> in other words, the dangerous ones. But if you do go on a walking safari and it's not too far, then it's useful to have a tripod to um, help you take the pictures, but also so that you can just rest your camera every now and again. These things are heavy. And then finally, a bean bag is very useful. Most uh, safari companies will provide you with bean bags, but you can always bring your own and you know, fill it with beans or something when you get there, just in case there aren't any available. So when it comes to the actual game drive itself, what should I take with me? So the first thing obviously is the camera. And also it's useful to have a cover for your camera and your lens. So it's very cheap to get waterproof covers these days. And it's not just a waterproof cover, 
but it also protects you against sunshine and various other things in the atmosphere, rain even, hail. Uh, you get some extraordinary weather conditions in Africa. And uh, then it just means that you don't have to worry about it. I also put my lens hood on my camera, and again, that does the same thing. Uh, you should also have your longest lens. If you only want to take one, then choose the longest one. If you do have a couple of camera bodies, or if you want to take a spare lens that you have to swap in midstream, then that's also fine. Uh, a lens cloth is very important. The front of your lens gets a little bit dirtier than you might think, and it's sometimes difficult to spot. So all you need to do is to examine it every now and again and just give it a quick wipe with a lens cloth very gently, and then uh, you should be fine. And obviously, uh, we'd need to take spares spare batteries and spare memory cards. Those are the two things that tend to run out. I tend to uh, buy the biggest, the longest lasting, the fastest equipment I can, but sometimes inevitably you're just taking too many shots and you just need a spare. Now binoculars are useful. As I say, I tend to be a little bit lazy sometimes. I rely on other people, the guide or the driver, but uh, it's always handy to have a pair when you're scanning the horizon, trying to find the animals. Polarizing filter, possibly, if you're that way inclined, and then a bean bag, very useful, even though there are hard surfaces and stable surfaces on the Jeep where you can rest your camera and your lens, it's always useful to have a bean bag because that gives a super, you know, stable, comfortable support. What should I wear? Well, it depends on the weather conditions, obviously, but uh, generally in Africa, you get huge ranges from very cold to very hot, very dry to very wet, so it's useful to be flexible. So I generally wear trousers uh, or sometimes shorts. I have zip-off safari trousers, so I can always turn them into shorts if I want to, which is useful. But uh, generally, I'm less worried about getting a suntan and simply protecting myself against the insects. Uh, so um, I generally keep them full length. And on top I wear a shirt, a t-shirt, or if it's a little bit colder, a base layer. I have some nice uh, merino wool base layers that are very handy, and you can put anything over the top of those. A sun hat is very important with a floppy brim, ideally, so not a baseball cap, because the brim just gets in the way when you're trying to take pictures. And then as you're on a Jeep most of the time, you just need comfortable shoes. They don't have to be particularly sturdy. They don't have to be hiking boots or anything. I generally wear trainers or even deck shoes. That's fine. You won't have to walk too far, so that's no problem at all. And a jacket is always handy. A little light rainproof jacket keeps you a little bit warmer and just in case there's a rainstorm, then you can uh, keep yourself dry as well. And then sunscreen and insect repellent, always handy. There are parts of the Serengeti where the uh, tetsi flies are a nightmare, so you need to keep them away. And I generally put my trousers in my socks uh, just to make sure they can't bite my ankles, which is quite common. What camera settings should I use? Well, I think if you're trying to stop the action, then you should be thinking of a thousandth of a second plus. So it could be a sixteen hundredth anywhere up to a 3,200th for birds in flight. However, if it's low light conditions or if you simply want to take a slow pan, like this shot of a cheetah next to the Jeep, then you should be thinking about something a lot slower. This was taken at around a hundredth of a second, but you can go right down to a 30th or even slower, depending on the animal. The slower the animal or the bigger the animal, generally the slower the shutter speed. So I've even taken a slow pan of an elephant at a quarter of a second. You just need to make sure you have a very stable platform. So you should also have the widest aperture, generally, because you want to have a minimal amount of depth of field. You want to be able to separate the animal from its surroundings, from the environment, unless you're trying to do an environmental portrait, perhaps, where you want to show the mountains, the hills, the trees in the background in which case you can uh, use f11 or f16 or something like that. Auto ISO is very handy these days uh, because you don't need to worry about exposure. However, if you're taking birds in flight, then it's very tricky. 
So it's useful to use manual ISO for birds in flight, but what that does mean is that you have to pre-focus, which means checking your exposure on something that's similarly lit. So if you're taking birds in the sunshine, find a rock in the middle of the sunshine that's a mid-tone, pre-focus on that, that will give you a correct ISO. Now, if you want to expose to the right, then you should probably add maybe two-thirds of a stop in exposure compensation. Now, the reason for that is because it's easier to get detail in the shadows, and it also prevents too much noise, which tends to accumulate in the shadow areas. That's optional, but try it out. Your shooting mode should also be continuous high, or the drive mode, and that just means that you can take as many pictures as you like. There will be occasions, however boring the day, when action happens very fast. So you need to be able to capture all of that. The worst thing in the world is when you're on a game drive and suddenly you see a kill and you take a picture and you keep your finger on the shutter but nothing happens and you suddenly realise you're on single shot. So don't be caught like that. You should also be using a single focus point. The crucial thing about wildlife photography is to focus on the eye of the animal. However, if you're taking pictures of birds in flight, then it's much easier to use a central cluster, so nine or ten of the central focusing points, and that way it's just easier for the camera to pick up focus. You can also play around with the settings for your uh, focusing, your auto-focusing, but that's a fairly advanced task. One thing I would suggest is learning how to use back button focusing. If you use your back button to focus rather than half pressing the shutter, then it gives you two new possibilities. First of all, you can lock the focus and the exposure, which means you can recompose. So you can take a picture of a lion, let's say, focusing on the eye, and then if you want to put him on the left-hand side of the frame instead, then you can recompose, take another shot, without having to worry about either the focus or the exposure. The other great thing you get is the ability to track animals in motion. So with this shot of the cheetah, for instance, I was in autofocus continuous on my Nikon, which is the equivalent of AI servo autofocus on the Canon. The cameras are very clever these days, so they're able to track animals in 3D, and that's the mode I use. I also try and set the correct white balance. Now I know that if you're shooting in RAW, which you should be, then it's easy to switch white balance in post-processing, but it's just difficult to remember. So if you've got changeable weather conditions, if sometimes the sun comes out and it goes back inside, and it's just very changeable and different, it's impossible to remember which shots are which. So it's much easier to try and get the white balance right when it changes, when you're actually out there on the game drive. All that means is effectively changing from daylight to cloudy, but sometimes you may select shade if you're taking a picture of a leopard in a tree or something. What should I do on the game drive itself? Well, the first thing to do is to be brave. Tell your guide what you want to see or do. Unless the guide knows that, he won't be able to give you what you want. So it's worthwhile just thinking about the kinds of things that are available, the kinds of wildlife that you might want to see, and they do have some options to try and give you what you want. So when I was in Africa in 2019, every morning at client's camp, they would ask us, what do you want to see today? And that wasn't just a fantasy list, it was basically a request that would help the driver to show you what you wanted to see by choosing the right environment. So if you want to see leopards, then you have to be in the trees, generally. If you want to see cheetahs, then you have to be in the open plains. So they can choose the right environment and that will help you to see the animals that you want to see. Now the other big choice you have, which will probably have to be a group decision, is either to spend time with the animals or go for a stop-start traditional safari. Now, normally, you'll simply drive around until you see an animal, 
stop for a few minutes while you take a few pictures, and then carry on until you see another animal, and then rinse and repeat. Now that's all very well, and you do get a broad spectrum of animals, you get lots of chances to take pictures of different animals, and at least you're doing something all the time, so you're less likely to get bored. However, you have to ask yourself whether you're likely to get the best possible pictures from that kind of approach. Now, when I went uh, to Kachechi Bush Camp with Paul Goldstein, he had a very different strategy. So his view was that the cats were the most important things, therefore he would try and find one and then spend time with it. So we ended up spending an awful lot of time with leopards and particularly cheetahs, and as a result, during a week, I saw five cheetah kills. Now, if I'd simply <clears throat> stopped in the vehicle, taken a couple of pictures and moved on, I wouldn't see a single one of those kills. So that's very important. But as I say, it's a group decision. It can be quite boring when the cats are simply sleeping or resting or lying in the shade, and you think, why are we here? This is dull. Let's go and find something else. But the payoff is, as I say, when they start to hunt. If you spend time with the animals, you are guaranteed to see that. And that is the most exciting part of wildlife photography. You should also get comfortable. So when you're going out on game drives every day, twice a day, then you need some kind of routine. Um, so on your little seat, you should have a nice comfortable position. You should get used to where your cameras are going to be so you know exactly where they are um, in an emergency. And you just make sure that you do everything so that you can keep comfortable and focus during the whole game drive. It can be a long old time on a game drive, particularly on the morning game drives, which tend to be longer than the evening ones. So you could be out there for at least six hours. So you need to make sure that you know, you're not worried about anything apart from looking out for the animals. Speaking of which, you should always keep a good lookout. I know it's tempting sometimes just to have a quick nap or to, uh, to relax, have a bit of a chat with the rest of the guests. But of course, if you're a keen wildlife photographer, you know the priority is to find the animals and take great pictures of them. So you have to remain focused. If you do make a sighting, then you should obviously tell people where the animals are. Now, there's a bit of an art to that. It's very difficult to understand where the animal is if someone just shouts out, look over there, or what's that over there? So as you get a little bit more experience, you might want to use the clock face, for instance. So you might say, oh, I think there's a leopard at 10 o'clock. And then if someone says how far, you can say you know, 50 yards away or so. If people have the uh, distance and range and the uh, direction, then it's much easier to find. Now, sometimes, obviously, it's even more difficult than that to find an animal when it's very well hidden or if it's a very small bird or something. And sometimes the guides will have pointers, little laser pointers. They won't harm the bird, they won't blind them or anything, they'll just um, draw a circle around them, but that can help as well. You should also take care of your kit. So sometimes there might be a you know, sudden rainstorm. I got trapped uh, in India once in the middle of a terrible rainstorm and we were in vehicles that didn't even have roofs. So that was almost catastrophic. We were desperately trying to protect our kit from this rainstorm. Even in the end, someone had to go around collecting people's cameras to put them in the boot, just in case they were too badly damaged. In the end, it was all right, it was no problem. But yes, please take care of your kit. And that means wiping the lens every now and again with your lens cloth, making sure they don't get wet or you know, dirty, whatever it is. You should also be a little bit sensitive of the other guests, so keep the noise down. You know, we don't want to frighten the way out of the animals, and some of these animals are very skittish. No matter how big or small the animal or bird, it's always a danger. If you make too much noise or if you make a sudden movement, you will end up frightening them off. And some of these might be once-in-a-lifetime sightings of a pangolin or something like that. So for the sake of everyone else in the vehicle, Please uh, keep the noise down, and obviously, don't rock the boat. And by that I mean, don't move around too much. It's very difficult to take a good picture if uh, the Jeep is unstable. So if you do have to move, just say sorry or something, whisper sorry, and be as quick as you can, as quiet as you can, and then get into a new position. 
and in general, we just have to be considerate about the rest of the guests. Okay, there's usually one person on the safari that people you know doesn't don't like or you know is a little bit difficult. But um, the more considerate we are, the easier it is for everybody. And I've generally been lucky on my safaris. I've always met some fantastic people. I think there's a bit of self-selection going on. The people who end up on safari tend to be successful and therefore intelligent, well-educated and good company. And obviously they're interested in the same things, wildlife, the outdoors and so on. So it pays to um, keep them on side. And finally, make the most of the sunset. And some places in the national parks, for instance, it's very difficult to take sunset shots because you're kicked out at about 6 o'clock or 6.30. However, the advantage of being in a concession or conservancy is that it's a private area where you can stay as long as you like. You can even go on night drives or evening game drives um, following your regular game drive. And uh, that means you can do whatever you like, take whatever pictures you like. And uh, obviously the sunset gives you a great chance to take pictures that are different from the usual run-of-the-mill shots of safari animals and you get some great colours and the opportunity to take silhouette shots as well. Now, after the game drive, what should I do when I get back? And the first thing is probably to copy your shots to your laptop. Uh, backup is always important in these environments, so you might want to keep your memory cards um, if you have enough of them, uh, just as a kind of backup. Usually there's no internet or not enough of a connection to be able to back up to the cloud, so it's always worthwhile just bearing that in mind. Once they're on your laptop, then you can rate your shots, uh, possibly cropping them first off, just so you see exactly what uh, they're going to look like. And then once you've come up with your list of your best shots, whether you've rated them three, four or five stars, then you can edit them. And that means playing around in Lightroom or Photoshop, whichever package you use, in order to make sure they look their best. You also should add metadata, whether or not you're going to sell the images. Even if someone asks you, you know, when you get back home, can I see all your shots of elephants? Well, it's going to be very difficult if you haven't tagged them with the word elephant. You have to go all the way through looking for them. It'll be a bit boring for everybody. So adding at least a title is useful, something descriptive like, you know, elephant chases away six lines from tree, something like that. And you can also uh, search with multiple tags, so that'll find something like that quite easily. However, there is a keyword section in Lightroom and in most other programs, so the more keywords you can put in, the easier it'll be to search. Once you've finished editing each image, you might want to export them as JPEGs. If you're using Lightroom, that's a non-destructive form of software, which means that you can keep your changes within Lightroom, but if you want to see the images outside Lightroom, then you have to export them as something else. All Lightroom does when it opens an image is to run through all your edits. So that's a one-off process that only takes a few seconds, but it does mean that it can only be done in Lightroom. But once you're exporting them as JPEGs, then anyone can see them. So if you want to sell them on stock agency sites, for instance, then you'll need JPEGs, maybe up to 20 megabytes with titles and keywords. The other useful thing you can do is to set up a list in Excel. It's quite easy once you have all the file names simply to import that into Excel. And then you can keep lots of important data about your pictures. So have you put them on sale? Which agencies have you used? Have you entered them into competitions? You know, what have they won? How many times have they sold? That kind of thing. And if you have a long list in Excel, then it's very easy to check you know, when it comes to entering competitions or doing your weekly upload, which ones you have to think about. And finally, when it's all done, then you can format your memory cards ready for the next day's play. So, what makes a good wildlife shot? 